Praise the Lord. All right, let's turn, if you would, to John chapter 10 tonight. John chapter 10. John chapter 10. John chapter 10, and uh, here in John chapter 10, we left off there at verse 16, 17, and 18 there, and uh, John chapter 10, of course this whole chapter here is a uh, discourse on the good shepherd, and we gave given you some things about sheep and different things and about a shepherd, <clears throat> John 10 uh, verse 15, as the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, that I lay down my life for the sheep. Uh, he says lay down several times. Verse 15, he says it once. Verse 17, he says I lay down my life that I might take it again. Verse 18, no man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. He says lay it down, lay it down, lay it down several times, which of course we went over last Sunday night, we went over the fact that because he says, I lay it down, uh, he offered no resistance. There's uh, no resistance. When the Roman soldiers came to take Jesus Christ to the cross, the, the Lord didn't fuss with them and tussle with them and resist and act like he didn't want to go. And uh, as we said, I believe he just, I believe he said, fellas, you didn't have to grab a hold of me, you Roman soldiers, uh, they're probably big old brute type guys, you know, because a lot of the people that were going to be led to the crucifixion back then they, they weren't like Christ. They, they were going to fight it because they didn't want to die <clears throat> that kind of a death, obviously. But Jesus, you know, of course, he, that's why he came to this world. And so I'm sure he probably said something like, I'm not trying to add to the Bible. I'm just saying you kind of use your imagination when you read the Bible. He probably just said, you fellas, don't, you let go of me. I'm going to go right over there and lay down on the cross there. He says, I lay it down of myself. And he did that voluntarily for you and I. And that's why he wants us to voluntarily serve him. And uh, live for him. We went over that. Verse 16. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Uh, other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Uh, we've gone over the fact that the Roman Catholic Church teaches that that's the sheep that, you know, left during the since the Reformation. They've left the Holy Mother Church, and, you know, we got to get them back into the fold, into the Catholic Church, which, of course, that's contrary to the Bible. Uh, the hyper-Calvinist will say the other sheep are the ones that are predestinated, you know, that are going to be saved in the future, that are predestinated and preordained before the foundation of the world. That's not true either. And uh, we went over the fact of what the other sheep is about the Gentiles and all that, and uh, we don't need to go over that again. Verse 17, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me. Now that's another reason there. No man taketh it from me. Not only does he say that he lays it down several times in these verses, in the context here, but he says, no man taketh it from me. So obviously, now you say, well, uh, preacher, how can they How can they be called murderers? In, in the book of Acts, uh, you've murdered and crucified the Holy One of Israel. How can they be called murderers when Jesus voluntarily laid down their life? He, they, that means that he didn't know the... The, the people are responsible for what was in their heart and for taking the Son of God and for putting him on the cross. So in that sense, they're murderers. But in Christ's sense, he laid down his life. But they still are accountable for murder. They still murder him. Both can be true at the same time. People say it's a contradiction. No, it's not a contradiction. They both can be true at the same time. No man taketh it from me, which uh, obviously reveals the fact that he uh, offered no resistance. But I lay it down of myself. I want you to think about that, folks. As I said before, and I don't, I don't mean to be just be repetitious, but I, you've got to think about this. Think about if you were getting ready to die a crucifixion. I mean, you knew that you were going to get nails in your hands and your feet. What a gruesome, painful, agonizing way to die. 
He knew it. And he went to the cross. He still went to the cross. And millions of people <clears throat> since the time of Christ don't want nothing to do with him. He did that for everybody. And people say, I don't care. I don't want it. They say, I got my religion. I'll be all right. Thank you, Jesus. But that's all right. Yeah. Now, you, you, that's a pretty good thing you did there. But I, I, I'll, I'll make it. No, they won't. They'll bust hell wide open. Amen. They'll burn in hell forever. You see, so... <clears throat> Verse 18, no man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. You see that? And then in verse uh, 19, this commandment, uh, or verse 19, there was division, therefore again among the Jews for these sayings. All right, and in the last part of verse 18, this commandment have I received of my Father. So he's going to lay it down. And, uh, of course, the, I have power to take it again. That's the resurrection. Power to lay it down and power, I have power to take it again. That's the resurrection. Now, notice in verse 19, it says, There is division, therefore, again, among the Jews for these things. Now, you read the Gospels, folks, and honestly, I'm not exaggerating or sensationalizing this thing. Everywhere Jesus went and opened up his mouth, there was problems. Every time he opened up his mouth, every time he made a decision, every time he... Or did something that you know glorify God the Father or whatever, or said something about you know himself being God or I and my Father are one, which he's getting ready to say here in another ten or fifteen verses, and they're going to go ballistic and go crazy on that. Every time there was division everywhere he went, everywhere in John seven forty three it says there was division because of him. John nine sixteen it says in John nine sixteen the end of the verse there was division among them. There's division everywhere he goes, and. Uh, and uh, division and controversy forever surrounded the ministry of Christ. He said in Luke 12, 51, that he came to bring division. He came to bring division. And, uh, and so you, you, have to, you have to realize that, you know, somebody told me recently that a preacher, I'm not going to say his name, but they said that a preacher listened to me on the radio. This guy's an independent Baptist preacher. He's a good man. He's a good man. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not offended by it. I'm, I'm not mad or nothing. But somebody told me, they said, yeah, they said, uh, said, I hear, I hear Steve Kogel on the radio, and he said, he sure does preach a lot of doctrine, doesn't he? <laughs> <clears throat> this is an independent Baptist preacher. Pastor's a good-sized Baptist church. I'm not going to tell you where, but he's within the listening audience of uh, the station out of Waverly, and, uh, which is 80-mile radius. And, uh, but anyways... <clears throat> He, yeah, I, I got, got wind of it. That he said, yeah, he said, I like him. He said, he does a good job. He said, man, he does preach a lot of doctrine, don't he? Let's see. 2 Timothy 4, 2. <laughs> preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. I'm commanded to do that. Amen. Every preacher is. You see? You know what a lot of people get mad? I'm not trying to be smart. Like, I'm really not. I'm just stating facts. What a lot of the brethren get upset about is they don't have the guts to say what I say. I know that sounds kind of arrogant, but I got to say it. All right? I have to say it. It's the truth. And I'm not saying it to be a smart aleck. I'm not saying it to be, I believe it's my job. I feel like it's my job to say the things that I say. I have never been one to get on the radio. <laughs> Never have, never will, by the grace of God, and just preach the gospel. Now, I preach the gospel. I say, I, we got several people in here in the church that have come because of the radio ministry. And Mark and Lisa said, they've been saying, we've been listening for several years now. And she's under old fashioned Holy Ghost conviction, and she got saved this morning. Amen. I'm saying, I preach <laughs> enough Bible and gospel for people to get saved, but I don't just preach the gospel. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. I expose false religions and false teachings and false doctrines because that's exactly what Jesus did when he was here in the Gospels. Do you know who murdered him? It wasn't the, the whoremongers and the adulterers and the fornicators and the prostitutes and the drug addicts and the drunkards and the alcoholics. It was the most religious people of his day, the Pharisees, are the ones that murdered him. They hated his guts. They're the ones that get, are going to get mad here in a little bit. They're going to get mad. Because he says, I and my Father are one. He made himself equal with God. He made himself God. He is God. Yeah. And he get, they got mad all the time about it. They said, who do you think you are? They thought they were somebody. 
So then here's this guy, 30 years old, 30, 31, 32, 33 years old. He comes along and says, I am the true vine. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the water of life. I am this, the resurrection life. All this I am, I am, I am, I am. And they thought, who in the world do you think you are, buddy? And they got mad at him. They hated his stuff. They hated him so much they murder him. Yeah. That's, 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 that's a dislike for somebody. Especially the way they crucified him. And so what I'm saying is, is that preach the word, be instant in season, obviously. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. Two thirds of preaching then is negative. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. 2 Timothy 4, verse 2 and 3. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. That's all right there in 2 Timothy 4. That's what I'm supposed to preach. And so, anyways, it's amazing. Uh, uh, but anyways, he says uh, there's division because of him. So everywhere he went, there's division. There was controversy. And if a preacher preaches what he's supposed to preach, preach and teach what he's supposed to preach, there will be some controversy. I mean, it might not be every second, every minute, but there will be some controversial thing. There will be some controversy. People aren't going to like it. They're not going to like it. People say, do you have to attack other people's religions? Well, I'm not attacking other people's religions. I'm exposing false religion, false doctrine, false teachings that damn people's souls to hell. We love people, as I mentioned the other night. We love souls. We love everybody that's a member of any kind of religion, any kind of a church. We love their souls. But we're going to expose false religious systems and teachings and doctrines that damn people's souls to hell. That's my job as a preacher. And of course, it rubs against the grain of even a lot of Christians because they just they watch so much television and slop and humanistic slop. That's like, oh, ooh, ooh, I don't think you need to do that. Ooh, well, can't you just preach the gospel? You know why they want you to do that? Just preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? Because that ain't gonna that isn't gonna put a butterfly. That ain't gonna do nothing to a butterfly. I mean, unless the person's lost. But let me ask you something. How can I perfect the saints? My job is to perfect the saints for the work of the ministry, Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. How do I perfect the saints? By just preaching the gospel every time I get right. up. Amen. Imagine me getting up every Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and just preaching and teaching the gospel. Well, you folks have been saved for 50 years, 30 years, 10 years. I mean, you're already saved. What's that good going to do you? You see, my job as a pastor is to perfect you. The way I perfect <laughs> you is to preach and teach the whole counsel of God. Yeah. Also, I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. The gospel is just a small part of the whole counsel of God. The gospel is just the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You've got 30, you know, 31, 33,000 uh, verses in the Bible. And really, when you get narrow it down, there, there is a very few amount of verses that deal with the gospel, the actual death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, out of thousands of verses. Now, we preach the gospel. We want to see people get saved, and we thank God Lisa got saved this morning. But uh, we wish that happened every service, but, or you know, at least every Sunday morning, if not every service. But uh, anyways, that, that's my job. That's why we go verse by verse. That's why we're teaching. We're teaching uh, on some of the radio stations. We're teaching uh, verse by verse in 1 Corinthians. The one, what we taught here at the church, we've got them on several of the stations. Now, we're on the Waverly Station. I'm teaching... Uh, I'm teaching John. I, put, I got John on there. I alternate John and Ruth back and forth and occasionally put in some messages in there. John and Ruth, John and Ruth in the, in the Waverly Station. So I'm teaching John, Ruth, 1 Corinthians. I'm, ready, I'm preaching messages. That's my job, you see, is to do this. And so Jesus, when he preached, he got, people got offended. They got mad. They get upset. And uh, they don't want you to do that. Uh, then going on in John 10, verse 19, there's a division, therefore, again, among the Jews for these sayings. Uh, for what sayings? Verse 17 and 18, about him laying down his life and that he has power to do it. They didn't like it when he talked about how that he has power to do certain things. They didn't like it when he says, I and my Father are one. The Pharisees didn't like these things that Jesus said. Verse 20, and many of them said, he hath a devil and is mad. They're accusing me crazy. Why hear ye him? In other words, don't hear him. He's mad. He's crazy. Is what they're saying. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 21. Others said, 
These are not the words of him that hath the devil. <clears throat> Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? So some people are saying, don't listen to him, don't hear him. He's mad, he's crazy, he's got a devil. And other people said, no, he can't have a devil. Can somebody has got the devil open up the blind, uh, uh, the blind eyes? The eyes of the blind? So there's everywhere he went, there's people that believed him, there's people that thought he was somebody, there's some people that didn't think he was anybody. I mean, it didn't matter. I mean, that's just, you know, what he uh, went through. Uh, he hath the devil. And back in John 7, 20, the people answered and said, Thou hast a devil who goeth about to kill thee. And then in John 8, 48, then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? All right, now starting in verse 22, Jesus is going to further assert his deity. Uh, he's going to and confront, uh, the Jews are going to confront Christ at the Feast of Dedication here. John 10, 22. And it was at Jerusalem, the Feast of the Dedication, and it was winter, winter time. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Uh, now, Solomon's porch. This here is the Feast of Dedication, Hanukkah, they call it today, I guess. Uh, Hanukkah, uh, it's Judaism. An eight-day festival beginning on the 25th, 25th day of Kislev, commemorating the victory in 165 B.C. of the Maccabees over Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, 215 to 164 BC, and the rededication of the temple at Jerusalem, also called Feast of Dedication, the Feast of Lights. Uh, this is a feast that began after the return from the exile. It begins about December 25th and lasts eight days. It was started by Judas Maccabeus to sanctify the temple after it was defiled by Antiochus Epiphanes. The word Hanukkah means dedication or initiation. I believe that they're the same thing. This feast takes place in the winter, which verifies the text. Then in verse 23, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Now Solomon's porch, this porch was a part of Herod's temple. It's mentioned three times in the Bible. Uh, Solomon's porch. In, the, in this text, it's where Jesus preaches to the Jews. In Acts chapter 3, multitudes flock to it after the healing of the lame man. And in Acts 5, the apostles preached and wrought miracles there. Uh, it ran along the eastern wall of the court of the Gentiles. Verse 24, John 10, 24. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. He's already told them a hundred times, I think. But, I mean, they just, you know, they just keep at it. They just keep at it. And tell us plainly. He just did in verse 2. He just did in verse 2. And uh, he says there, uh, He that entereth in by the door, the sh uh, door is the shepherd of the sheep. And uh, so, while it should be plain by now that Jesus is the Christ, it seems odd that he did not just come out and say, Okay, I am he. Of course, they, you know, he's said it uh, several times and hidden around at that thing. Uh, verse 25, uh, going on, Jesus answered them, I told you and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of. But you believe not because you're not of my sheep as I said unto you. Uh, look how plain that is. You're not of my sheep as I said unto you. You're, you're not one of my sheep. Then he says, my sheep hear my voice. Great eternal security verses right here. 27, 28, 29, 30. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I've given them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My father which gave them me is greater than all and no man's able to pluck them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. You got to try to memorize them verses if you can. At least a couple of them. 27, 28 at least. And uh, those are great eternal security verses. Pluck them out of my Father's hand. Isn't it nice to know that you're secure in the hands of the Lord? Amen. They say, these commercials say, you're in good hands with all states. I'll tell you what, you might be in good hands with all state, but you're in better hands than the God's hand. Amen. 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 And uh, let, let me tell you about some good hands. In Deuteronomy 5.15, it says, Remember, you were servants in the land of Egypt, and I brought you out with a strong and mighty hand. Joshua 4, 23 and 24, 
The Lord dried up the waters of Jordan, that all the people of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord it is mighty. Matthew 8, 3, this is the hand that touched the leper and cleansed him. Matthew 8, 15, hand, his hand touched Peter's mother-in-law and the, and the fever left. Hey. Peter had a mother-in-law. That means he was married. Right. And the Catholic Church says he was the first pope. Wasn't a very good pope if he's married. <laughs> All right? Yeah. And uh, he's got a mother-in-law. Not supposed to be married. And uh, so, anyways. <laughs> You just got to read the Bible. Yeah. Matthew 9, 25. This is the hand that touched the daughter of Jairus and gave her life. And then Matthew 14, 31. This hand kept Peter from drowning in the depths of the sea. The Lord just slipped, put that hand down here when Peter started sinking there. We started walking on the water. Matthew 14, 31. And the Lord's hand just saved Peter right out of the water. And I'm glad we're in those hands. Amen. Amen. These are the hands that were pierced on Calvary that bought my soul and paid for my sins. If you want security, you want to be held in his hands. Amen. Now, I preached a message here a while back uh, about the hands of Jesus. Uh, look at John 20, since we're in John. I'll just give you the outline real quick. If you want the whole message, you can get it, Matt. You can tell Matt you want it. Uh, but uh, I don't have time to re-preach the whole thing tonight. But uh, i just give you the basic outline. Uh, look at John 20 after he resurrects. John 20, verse uh, 20, verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, <coughs> excuse me, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Verse 20, and when he had so said, he showed unto them his hand and his side. See that? His hands. And then down here in verse 25, uh, Thomas says, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails. His hands there. Verse 27, then saith he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands. My hands. So his hands are mentioned through there. And I, I got an outline I preach about the hands of Jesus. His hands are big hands. They're big hands. I tell you what, some of them basketball players in the NBA, they got great big hands. They can, they can palm that basketball like that, and it's like a baseball in their hands. But they don't have as big a hands as my Savior does. Amen. His hands are big hands. And uh, I preach a bunch of things about that. His hands are big enough to, uh, I mean, there's like seven or eight things I bring out about how uh, his hands are big. Uh, they're blameless hands. Uh, he was he uh, is in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Uh, they're blameless hands. He never, he never uh, uh, held a glass of liquor in his hands or anything like that. He never touched a woman in an illicit manner. His, his hands are blameless. They're big hands. Thirdly, they're blessing hands. Everything he touched, he blessed. He's a, he, he's a blessing God. Uh, number four, he's a, uh, his hands are bearing hands. Bearing up, B-E-A-R. Bearing, be bearing up. Uh, he bore our sins. He bore our griefs. Uh, he bore the cross. He bore our sicknesses. And uh, by his stripes you're healed. Charismatics use that verse in Matthew 8, 17. Say, see there, bless God. You ought to be healed in the name of Jesus. You're healed. Doesn't mean that at all. You know what you need? You need a permanent healing. God might heal you 50 times in this life. Permanent healing. And I pray God does heal you. If you're sick, I pray God heals one week just prayed for God to do healing. I pray God heals everybody a thousand times. But you're still going to die. Yeah. What you need is a permanent healing. You need a new glorified body. Yeah. That's what we need. So his hands are big hands, blameless hands, blessing hands, bearing hands. They're bleeding hands. They're bleeding hands. And uh, we have forgiveness through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Washes from our sins in his own blood. They're bleeding hands. Uh, and then they're, uh, they're bruised hands. It pleased the Lord to bruising. Isaiah 53, verse 10. They're, they're bruising hands. And then they're building hands. They're building hands. Uh, several things on that, if I can read it here. My part pages are falling out and parts of my Bible here. Uh, they're, uh, they're building hands. They build, uh, you are God's husband or you are God's building. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 9. God builds us. So we pray that we pray that Lisa, now that she got saved, that she is built up in the faith, that she grows. 
uh, what's that verse, Acts 20, 32, and now behold, uh, uh, rather than I commend you to God in the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. The word of his grace, which is able to build you up. Acts 20, 32. So we pray that the word of God builds her up and she grows in the Lord. Uh, he builds He builds homes, except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain to build it. Psalms 127, verse 1. He builds Christians. He's built in the church. I can't build a church. People come in here. You folks come in here. You come in here because God sent you in here. We, we you know, if the weather breaks here, we're going to go out knocking on doors. But, you know, when the weather breaks here, summer, or at least spring, summer, and fall, and uh, the weather's halfway decent. So we go out knocking on doors and pass out flyers, things like that. We're on eight radio stations, and we're inviting people out and so forth. And, and uh, people in the church invite people about and witness to people on their jobs and, and uh, their neighbors and everything like that. And I'm going to tell you what, the Lord is the one that builds the church. I found out years ago I can't build a church. I'm not a church builder. I can preach and teach the Bible and try to be faithful to the Lord and do what God wants us to do, but God brings people through that door right there. If God don't bring people through that door right there, ain't nobody going to come through that door. God's wants God to do it. We could be on 10,000 TV and radio stations in this whole area. Be on 24 hours a day. But if God don't send people here, they ain't coming. God's the builder. He said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Matthew 16, 18. Right. So he's a church builder, a Christian builder, a home builder. Uh, he builds all things. Everything. All right, and then last of all, his hands are beckoning hands. Beckoning. We beckoned this morning, and Lisa came down and took heed. She wanted to be saved. Under old-fashioned Holy Ghost conviction. That's what we pray, folks. We pray that the Lord will deal with people's hearts and that they'll, they'll be convicted and if they're not saved, and they'll get saved. And we, we just want to help people. We want, we, want, we, we want to see people get saved. We want to see people grow in the Lord. And uh, that's my desire. I don't have any other, other desire. And uh, that, and uh, until I die, until I can't preach no more, I die, or I'm raptured. Uh, John 10, uh, verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Uh, he knows them, he keeps them, he protects them, he leads them, and he feeds them. I think I gave you that little outline. A shepherd, he knows them in verse 14 and verse uh, uh, 11. He keeps them, verse 28. He protects them here in the chapter. He leads them, and uh, verse 3, and he feeds them. All right, so a shepherd feeds all right, that's, he's the great shepherd, and he feeds us, uh, and so forth. And then verse 28, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. They shall never perish. You see that? So uh, Jesus makes several definitive statements on the eternal security of the believer here, and in the next few verses, here he pl says plainly that he knows his sheep. Yet in Matthew 7, 23, he says to the damned, I never knew you. Depart from me. He doesn't say, I used to know you, but I don't know you anymore. If you have trusted Christ as your Savior, then He knows you. Amen. He knows you personally. And if He knows you, He can never look at you in the eye at the judgment and say, I never knew you. He'd be a liar. God's not a liar. Amen. Verse 28, and I've given them eternal life. Here Jesus claims that the life He gives to the believer is eternal. If you could lose it after five or ten years, then it's hardly eternal. How can you say eternal when you could lose it? You'd be a liar. It comes down, eternal security and even other doctrines in the Bible, it just comes down to hell. You know why people sit in the kingdom hall? Because they don't want to believe in hell. Yeah. I mean, it comes down to a lot of different things, a lot of doctrines and teachings. It just comes down to believing what God said. That's what it comes down to, just believing it. And not changing the verses and going to a new version of the Bible. Uh, now, some people say the life is eternal. Yes, the life is eternal, but the length of time that you had it was limited to five or ten years. That's what they say. That's what these people believe you can lose it. That's what they say. They say, yeah, you have eternal life, but he don't mean that it's going. That's how long it's going to last. It's uh, you got to endure to the end and hold out faithful to the end. And then you go to heaven and you have eternal life. No, I have eternal life right now as a present possession. 
He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him, John 3, 36. John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, present tense, right now, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Here in John 10, 28, I give them eternal life, they shall never perish. If I got saved, and then I perished 5, 10, 20, 30, 40 years after I got saved, died and went to hell, Jesus would be a barefaced liar. He said, because he said, I'd never perish, and I perished. If I could, which I can, but I'm just saying, if they're right, they're wrong. Amen. It's just a matter of believing God. If I believed I could lose my salvation, I mean, I'd bite my fingernails, as you can see, the way it is. But I'd be biting, I'd just be chewing my fingers. Y'all wouldn't even have no fingers. I'd be like this. <laughs> Am I saved? Am I lost? Do I have it? Can I get it? Did I lose it? Did I have, can I get it back? There's nothing in the Bible about repetition and regeneration. Amen. There's nothing in the Bible about getting saved more than once. Great, and when Jesus was hanging on the cross of Calvary, he didn't say, I did my part. Now you do your part. Yeah. No, he said, it is finished. Amen. Yeah. John 1930. It's finished. He didn't say, some people believe that Jesus was saying, well, I did my part. Now you do your part. I'll do a little bit. You do a little bit. We'll mix it in together and hopefully it'll be enough to get you to hell. That's man's way. Yeah. That isn't God's way. And I've said this many times. I'll say it again. After I got saved, the guy led me to the Lord. He said, now I'm going to give you some eternal security verses because it won't be a week. And it was less than a week. Believe me. Four days or something. There at the job. Somebody, some guy believed it was raised. Believed you could lose it. He come up here, and I, him and I argued about it. I was a young Christian. I didn't care. I was, I was, I was ready to argue. I was 20 years old, man. I was ready to fight, you know. And uh, <clears throat> he said, I said, I, I said, Ray, his name's Ray. He's probably dead now, but he, I said, Ray, and he got saved, but he just believed he could lose it. He was raised in a Pentecostal church. Bless his heart. He's a good guy. He just fouled up. And, uh, and he said, uh, I said, Ray, I said, Jesus said, you'll never perish. You got everlasting eternal life. His face turned blood red. So help me, God knows I'm not lying. His face turned blood red. And he said, Brother Cobo, he says, I don't care what the Bible says. I'm telling you that you can walk away from the Lord and be lost. That's exactly, God knows I'm not lying. That's exactly what the man said. His face was red when he was saying it. Because he knows he was <coughs> acting like a fool. And, uh, <coughs> but it's just a matter of believing. And my question is, why wouldn't a Christian want to believe in eternal security? Yeah. That's my question. My question is, why would somebody fight that and resist that? And, you know, I can understand if God called you to go live in a hut in Africa, you know, you and your wife and you know, five kids or whatever you got, and you don't want to drag your kids over to Africa and live in a hut with spiders as big as I am and, you know, bears and snakes and lions and tigers and stuff. I can see why you might resist and fight the Lord about stuff like that the call of God in your life, if you don't want to do it, which I don't think, I mean, I still think we all ought to do it, we obey the Lord, but I'm just saying, I can understand a little bit how somebody might fight the Lord about that. Well, why would people fight the Lord about eternal security? It's, it's like you're telling a Christian, hey, buddy, hey, brother, I just want to tell you something. I, just, I got a blessing for you. You're saved, you're saved forever, you're never going to go to hell. You think they'd say, well, praise God. Some people say, what do you mean? I can still burn in hell. <laughs> don't tell me buddy yeah. it's like they want to it's like they want to burn in hell yeah. it, it's crazy man it's like it's like what it's like you, you think that you just took the butcher knife and stabbed him or hit him or smacked him or something don't tell me oh yeah you can brother yeah I'll fight you the bitter and you can lose your salvation Kogel. it's like what in the world <laughs> what are you mad about that for you're mad because you got eternal life you're mad because you got everlasting eternal life. You'll never go to hell and burn forever, ever, ever, ever. You're mad. <laughs> the only thing I can think of, man, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just telling you. I don't understand. I told Al, I said, he said, it won't be a week. Somebody will try to tell you you lose your salvation. I said, I, was a new, I just got saved. I was a baby. I, I was drinking milk, man. Goo, 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 goo. I was a little baby of the Lord. I said, lose it. I said, Al, if, I thought, if you come to me and told me I could lose it after I got it, I said, I'd look at you. I'm not going to tell you what I would have told you. Get out of here, man. You tell me I need to get saved because I'm going to burn in hell, so you need to receive Christ. But 5, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the road, if I don't endure to the end and live it 
and uh, do all these things and not do these things and do this and that. I, I can still lose it and die and go to hell. I said, I'm not even going to mess with that. What kind of salvation is that? And sure enough, a few days, buddy. Right after, I'm going to tell you, I, I didn't really have a chance to tell Lisa this this morning. I wished I would have. I want to think about it. But anyways, I guarantee you she works a job, her and Mark both. Mark works on the roads out here. He's the one who did his blacktop on 62 here and I'm on 50 and all that. That works for uh, county here or something. Anyways, I don't know where she works, but she works a job. And I should have told her, Lisa, I'm going to tell you this week, this week, tomorrow, <coughs> you're going to have all these experts on your job coming up and telling you, do you talk in tongues? You don't have a Holy Ghost. Do you go to church on, you don't need to come to our Seventh day Adventist church and come to church on Saturday, because that's the Sabbath. Do you go to church on Saturday? Have you been baptized according to Acts 2.38? You don't have the Holy Ghost then. Are you a member of this church or that church that you're not really saved and you're not going to heaven? You're going to get all these experts on salvation that start coming around after that new converts get saved. That's what happens. It's a spiritual warfare. The devil knows what he's doing. And I say, you're going to have all the... I should have told her, I'll tell her next time they come. I remember it. But uh, you're going to have all these people. You might even have some relatives, neighbors, people that you work with. You're, they're going to start trying to make you doubt your salvation. You don't. Have, you didn't really get saved. You don't have the Holy Spirit. All these different things. Because that's what happens. Right after prayer. None of these people witness to you before you got saved. They don't witness to you. If they do, they tell you a false doctrine, a false gospel, another gospel, if they do. But none of them witness to you. But right after a new baby, newborn baby Christian gets saved, the heretics pounce on them. That's what happens. Usually the first few weeks, first few months, first couple years, the devil really works to destroy her effectiveness for the Lord. She's a bubbly woman. She loves the Lord and she wants to serve God. She's got some enthusiasm and the devil's going to try to quench it and grieve it and make her doubt that she even got saved. I guarantee you on the way home, I guarantee you the devil said to her, the devil did it to me, and I'm sure he did it to you, the devil said, you didn't get saved. You went down to the altar and was crying. You made a fool out of yourself. Everybody goes through a religious experience like that. Lisa, you didn't get saved. That's what the devil told me. All the way home when I got home, say 11.30 at night, I got saved Thursday night, June 16, 1977. I, I, I was going home. I had to go to work next morning. And uh, I had 270 hour belt in Columbus up there. And uh, all the way home, the devil said, you stupid fool. You didn't get saved. I said, I, I was talking to the devil out in my car. I said, devil, how's come you're telling me this now? You never told me this before I got saved. How's come the devil never told me this before I got saved? <coughs> Think about that. Yeah. You know why he never told me that? That you're not saved? Because I wasn't saved. Yeah. Now that you are saved, he's going to fight you trying to make you think you're not saved. Yeah. Now you say, well, how do I know if I'm saved? If you died right now, what are you trusting in to get you to heaven? Yeah. I can stand here and say, I trust this pulpit here to, to hold me up. I can say that all day. But until I lean my 120 pound body, <laughs> plus a few more pounds, uh, <coughs> not more pounds, if I, until I lean up against this, I can say it all day. I can say, I believe that doctor is a good doctor, and I believe that he'll do a good heart surgery or brain surgery on my brain or heart surgery on my heart. I believe that with all my heart. But until I let him put me under, let him do it, that's really trust. And you know what I'm trusting in? If I fell dead right now, I'm trusting in the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. That washed away my sins. Amen. You think I'm trusting in my baptism? You think I'm trusting in any good works? You think I'm trusting in church membership or religion or anything? No. I'm, I'm trusting in the precious blood of Christ. I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ as my Savior. Amen. That's the that's how you know you're saved. Yeah. You say, well, I don't know if I'm putting my faith and trust. Well, you can find, you can know about it for sure tonight. 
just like Lisa did this morning. Amen. You can know for sure that you're saved, that you're born again. And uh, you ask people today if they're saved, they say, "Yeah, I, I think I, I think I'm I think I make it. I'm, I'm pretty good. I, I try to do good." And I'm, you know, I mean, there's people that say they're Christians. I think I'm just as good as they are. That person's lost when they say that. Or they'll say, "Are you saved?" They say, "Well, yeah, I got baptized." We're not talking about being baptized. Or are you saved? Yeah, I'm a member of this church. If you ask a Catholic today if they've received Christ, they believe that they're receiving Christ is receiving the wafer every Sunday morning in Mass. So when you've got to be careful when you talk to these religious people that you know they're re, they're receiving Jesus and they're being born again is a different definition of what you're talking about. So when, if I really don't think they really are, they act like they are, but I, I kind of in my heart and spirit don't think they really are. You say, well, who are you to judge? I'm nobody to judge. I just you have to go by what the Lord leads you. I'll say, well, friend, let me ask you something. If you were to die right now, Amen. what would you tell the Lord? The Lord would say, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you tell him? That will reveal. Then stop. Then stop. Let them answer. And let them answer. And what they say determines whether they're saved or not. Right. If they say, well, I, I, I've tried to be good. I've tried. They're lost. Amen. Well, I got baptized. They're lost. Well, I'm a member of the church, or whatever church. Uh, they're lost. Ask me. Hey, Steve Kogel, are you saved? <coughs> I sure am. June 16, 1977, on Thursday night. And you don't have to know the exact day and time and minute, but just know that you are. I, re I repented of my sins and received Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Yeah. I'm trusting nothing but His precious blood to get me to heaven when I die. Simple as that. I've heard some people's convert so-called conversion uh, experiences and stories and testimonies, and it was kind of like, ooh, <laughs> <laughs> It was real vague. It was real, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just saying it's real vague. It don't have to be no vagueness to it. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. 1 John 5, 12. Every word in that verse is a one-syllable word. The Lord made it pretty simple. One syllable. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things are written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know they have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Yes. We can know that we're saved. Amen. Know. And uh, most religions and so-called churches and religious organizations, they don't believe you can know. Right. Paul said, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Yes. 2 Timothy 1.12. You might not know about a lot of things. You might not know about the economy and political situation and what North Korea is going to do and Syria and Iraq and Iran and and, uh, and all these countries and all, Russia and everybody and the, the future events and all that. You might not know specifically exactly what everybody's going to do, whatever the uh, stock market and the financial situation, but you can know that when you die, you're going to heaven. Amen. You can know that. Now, I've worried about a lot of things in the last 40, 41 years, but I've never worried about dying and going to hell. Yeah. You say, what do you mean? You think you're somebody? I don't think I'm anything at all. But I believe he's somebody. Amen. I Amen. put my faith in him, yeah. trusting in him to get me out of hell, to keep me from hell. I don't want to burn. I've burned the tip of my finger before, and it, oh, man, it hurts. You want to put it in water. <sighs> Soothe it. There's no water in hell. Yeah. And your whole body, just your tip of your finger, it's your whole body burns. Just as people that go to heaven get a new glorified body in heaven, people that go to hell will get a new body that will never be burned up. It will never be annihilated. And they'll burn forever. Right. What a terrible thing. Your loved ones, your family members, they might be dear, sweet people. Probably most of them are. If not all of them. But if they're not born again, I'm not talking about getting baptized. I'm not talking about being a member of a church and going to church once in a while and acting a little religious and all that. If they've not been truly born again, they're not going to heaven. Right. I love my mother and father. I love my family members. But if they're not truly born again, they're not going to heaven. They will not go to heaven. The Lord, you, people think they're going to stand in front of the Lord and they're going to say, well, Lord, I tried to be the best I could, and I, you know, my, my my daughter here, and my son, they're Christians, and my wife or my husband, they were good Christian people, and 
and uh, you, they think they're going to be able to bribe the Lord because they bribed a bunch of people down here about a lot of junk. You're not going to be able to do that to the Lord. Right. You're not going to do that. They didn't like that with God. So we think God's like that we are. He, he's not. Yeah. If you're saved, you're going to heaven. Yeah. If you're lost, no matter who you are, no matter who you're related to, mm -hmm. if you're lost, if your family's lost, you'll die and go to hell. That's why it's so important. You say, well, I don't want to witness to them or mail them a gospel track or invite them to church because I'm afraid of what they might say. Who cares? The most they're going to say is, I don't want to hear it. I ain't coming. So what? I mean, so what? That's the most, I mean, what are they going to do? Are they going to shoot you? You say, Brother Kogel, you preacher, you don't know some of my relatives. They might shoot me. Oh, well, you'll go on to heaven, I guess, then. Yeah? I mean, most people aren't going to shoot you. Come on now, they're not going to shoot you. And... Uh, Stab you, they won't shoot. No, I'm just kidding. But anyways, uh, I mean, you know, there's people that die for the sake of the Lord. Fox's Book of Martyrs, there are people have been tortured for their faith in Christ. Right. And uh, so here in John 10, 28, here Jesus uh, claims, uh, I give them eternal life, they shall never perish. He claims that the life he gives the believer is eternal. And uh what good is it if it just lasts for a little while? No one living has ever used their eternal life yet. We are all still running on what we got from our parents. What good is eternal life that no one can keep? And they shall never perish. Those who die without Christ will perish in hell. Yet this statement says that if Christ has given you eternal life, you can never perish. If you're saved right now, you can never perish. And no man's able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. And uh, now... I, I've heard I've heard people say, "Well, uh, you can fall out, <laughs> or you can jump out." Now think about this. Brother Gitt mentions this in his commentary of John. He says, "At this point, those who argue in favor of losing their salvation get ridiculous." He said, "When it's pointed out to them that no man can pluck them out of their father's hand, I've heard them actually say, what if you fall out?'" Now he said, "Can you picture God in heaven holding you one minute?" And the next minute, he looks over and says, whoops, what happened here? Where'd they go? Oops, I dropped them. <laughs> People want to believe what they want to believe. Yeah. I've heard him say, we can jump out. You can jump out. Gibbs says, if they'll please get close enough to the edge, I'll push them out. <laughs> you got to know Gibbs' sense of humor, but... He said, but that still doesn't work. Why? Because our Father is in heaven. If you could fall or jump out of his hand, you would still be in heaven. Granted, you would be on the floor, but you'd be in heaven nonetheless. I'll take the floor in heaven to any part of hell. I'll lay on the floor throughout eternity rather than be in hell. Amen? And then I'll close with this. I, verse 30, John 10, 30, I and my Father are one. Jesus' statement here shows his references to us being in his hand <coughs> and in his Father's hand at the same time was no accident. He is once again smacking the Pharisees in the face with his deity. I and my Father are one. And they pick up stones to throw them at him in the next verse, verse 31. You want to know why? And I'll close. The reason why is for two reasons. He made himself equal with God, saying, basically, I am God. I and my Father are one. Who do you think you are? What do you mean you and your Father are one? And secondly, they got mad, not only because he made himself equal with God, but he just taught eternal security. And self-righteous religious people hate the doctrine of eternal security. Because their, their whole system, folks, let's think about it. Do I need to name all the churches and religions? No, I'm not going to do it. But their system is based, their religion is based on keeping their people in bondage that you got to get baptized. you got to have good works. you got to hold out to the end. you got to keep coming to church. you got to keep tithing. You don't do it, you'll, you'll die and go to hell. Now, we believe in being faithful to church and giving God tithes and offerings and all that kind of stuff. But we, I don't teach that. We don't believe that as Bible believers. We don't believe that as part of your salvation. You do it because you love the Lord. And you want to be put God first. All right? Good works are for a testimony. Right. But they teach it as part of their structure, their religion, their church and denomination as part of the getting to heaven. And if you, when you teach eternal security, 
you blow that thing to smithereens because their whole system and their preachers and priests and elders and bishops and everything and all these religions, and I don't need to name all of them because I do all the time, but anybody that doesn't teach you salvation by grace through faith, that's who I'm talking about. All right? They're all over Highland County. They're all over America. They're all over the world. All right? All these false religions. Another gospel, another Jesus, another spirit. Their whole structure of religion and church is based upon the fact of keeping their people's head underneath the water and making them think, up, up, not up. You got to keep on, don't do it. Keep coming to church. Keep tithing, giving to the church. You got to keep doing this. You got to keep doing that. Have good works or you won't go to heaven. You just won't make it. Their whole religion and structure is based on that. So when uh, when somebody like me or another Bible-believing preacher on the radio or in a pulpit stands up and says, there is nothing you can do to be saved. you got to trust in Christ to be saved. Paul called that the offense of the gospel in Galatians 5 and 6. You read Galatians 6 especially, in chapter 5, 5 and 6. He talks about the offense of the gospel is when you tell a person the very best they can do will land them in hell, that makes them matter and horn because everybody, everybody self, we all have a, 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 a part of self-righteousness in us. We all want to believe that there's something that we can do and something we have to do to get our souls to heaven. That's why these people believe all this stuff. Because they believe, they, if you tell them about salvation being a free gift to God, they say, oh, it's not that easy. It's not, you've got to do something, man. I mean, come on now, preacher. <laughs> it ain't that easy. I mean, you you got to do something. No, you don't. You got to repent and receive Christ as your Savior. <clears throat> That's the offense of the gospel. People get offended. They get mad. That he said he suffered persecution. In Galatians three, Galatians five and six, both those chapters. <clears throat> uh, when you get home, <clears throat> and so uh, it's the offense of the gospel. The offense. People are offended because you're tell Paul told him he said. You're saved by grace through faith. With that, not, not of yourselves. Not of yourself. It's the gift of God. That smacks people right in the face because they think it is of them. Because they think there's somebody. And when you tell it's a free gift, you just smack them in the face. I mean, spiritually speaking. You just smack them in the face because they the, the whole structure of these religions are all built upon good works. And something you've got. Now, they might differ a little bit about what you've got to do. You know, you got to get, do a wafer, and you got to do this, and you got to do the holy water, and you got to do Hail Mary, and you got to go have good works, and you got to go to Mass, and you got to be baptized, and you got to have this good work. And the Mormons teach you after you're lost, your dead, your dead loved one dies, and you're baptized for them. As many times you're baptized, they move up to a special place in heaven and get a higher place in heaven. I mean, all this stuff, goofy junk. Right. And it's all built upon works. Right. You doing something. You have to do something. <laughs> Go out here in downtown Hillsboro tomorrow at 12 noon and ask the average person, what, do, does, do, does a person have to do something to get to heaven? They say, well, yeah. And they'll, they'll vary. They'll differ a little bit, maybe. Different religions and false cults and religions and churches. But, they, but when you say you're saved by grace, you're kept saved by grace, even these Christians that believe you can lose it, bless her, a lot of them are saved. They believe they got to hold on and hang on. They want to believe that good works are a part of staying saved. They believe you're saved by grace through faith, but then you got to hold on. You have to endure. You have to keep on going. You got to keep on salvation, or you might lose it. Do you know what I'm saying? It's not only the false cults and religions. You got even a lot of Christian churches. I won't name them because some of you get mad and offended, but I can name you right here in Highland County. Churches that believe in being born again, they believe in being born again by grace through faith. Amen, amen. But you got to hang on. you got to hold on, brother. You might not make it. They, they're believing that works are a part of their salvation, whether to get it or to keep it. We don't believe either. We don't believe you work to get saved. You don't work to stay saved. You work because you are saved. Amen. Good works are for a testimony. Amen? Uh, 